Welcome to the Center of Everywhere podcast, where we explore stories of rural Minnesotans who are making a difference in their communities. Rural isn't in the middle of nowhere. It is in the center of everywhere. And it's episode 23 of the Center of Everywhere podcast. I'm Barney Werner, and I'm the Vice President of Research at the Center for Rural Policy and Development. And joining me today are two guests, graduate students from the Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. If you're a regular listener to the Center of Everywhere, you'll remember Whitney Oakes, who has been our research intern here at the Center for the past year. And with her is Josiah Moore. They will both be graduating here in a couple weeks, but in order to do that, they need to complete a capstone project a research project examining some policy issue. We've had the pleasure of working with Whitney and Josiah and the other members of their research team on this project. And it's almost done now, and it's going to shed some light on how local governments interact with the immigrants and refugees living and working in their communities. So welcome, Whitney and Josiah. Uh, It's great to have you here, and why don't you tell us a little bit about your degrees that you'll be getting, and just what a capstone project is. Yeah, thank you so much, Marnie, and thank you for having us on the Center of Everywhere. Really happy to be here. So I am a Master of Public Policy student at the Humphrey School. There's a couple different program options, but public policy was just Uh, more at my field, and and I'm looking at politics and governance and and rural policy predominantly throughout my degree. And our capstone project is essentially a thesis, but we do it uh, as a group, since so much policy work is done as group work. And we partner with clients like the Center for Rural Policy to make sure that the projects that we're doing at the Humphrey School have actual applications uh, out in the real world and, and for organizations. And Josiah, welcome. And why don't you tell us a little about yourself too? Uh, Thanks, Marnie, and thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, So I'm Josiah Moore. Uh, I'm also pursuing a master's in public policy degree uh, at the Humphrey School. Um, And, you know, you can do a lot of things with it. I've focused a lot on housing policy. Whitney got me into rural policy. Uh, You know, we're we're close friends and she lent me a few books and... uh, and uh, help me help me get into it for this. So why rural policy, either of you? Well, I can start. That okay. one's easy for me. Uh, I grew up in uh, the St. Croix River Valley, northwestern Wisconsin, town of about a thousand people. So, you know, rural politics, rural policy, it's all really important to me. Um, and it's it's been really cool, actually at the Humphrey School to use this higher education training towards issues that face where I'm from, because you know, I know growing up in a rural area that the policy issues, the things that need to be addressed, governance, everything is really different in rural areas in comparison to urban areas. And we don't necessarily see that represent, representation all the time. And so it's really exciting for me to get to work on these topics and um, just like bring that extra viewpoint into the literature. Josiah, how about you? Yeah, uh, well, I'm interested in in rural policy uh, because I I just don't like what I see as far as how, you know, a lot of people uh, conceive of rural areas and rural people. I think there's a lot of misconceptions. I think there's there's a lot of, describing rural people as bigoted and when in fact that's uh you know there there's some really negative attitudes that that come close to bigotry towards rural people uh in a lot of ways uh and so i'm really interested in doing a project that that treats rural people with dignity that treats people in greater minnesota with dignity and that um i don't know can start to work against this rural urban divide that we are seeing in minnesota politics Great. So now tell us about the Capstone Project and what you've been looking at. So our project is called Building Community, Embracing Difference, Immigrants, Refugees, and Local Government Outreach in Rural Minnesota. And so the objective for this study was to investigate how 
local governments across rural Minnesota have welcomed growing immigrant and refugee communities and identify whether government actions are meeting the expressed needs of these communities. Um, we know uh, just from looking at demographic changes in the state of Minnesota that rural Minnesota is uh, diversifying in pockets. There, there's pockets of diversity uh, across rural areas of the state. And this isn't just you know a couple families of color moving in. This is uh, massive population changes. You know you can look at Pelican Rapids, which doubled its population uh, following the the first influx of refugees in the 1990s and early 2000s. And there's just not a lot of literature on this topic. And particularly when you're looking at issues of diversity, it it really has focused on the literature is really focused on urban areas. And for some logical reasons, uh, but we realized in our study that we wanted to look at rural areas simply because there isn't enough conversation going on around inclusion and outreach efforts out there, in part because these communities lack the resources that are available in, in urban areas. Josiah, do you wanna add on to that at all about kind of the scope of our project? Yeah, uh, I would just add on that there, we have additional partners in addition to uh, the Center for Rural Policy in the Minnesota Council for Latino Affairs uh, and a couple other Minnesota councils. Um, and so their, their partnership tells me that maybe people are starting to realize that they need to pay more attention to the, the diversity that's, that's growing in rural Minnesota that, that, the, that you know, the, the Council for Latino Affairs can't just focus on the metro area. They have a, a lot of population to serve elsewhere in the state. And so they're ready, you know, they're ready and willing to start looking at, at what needs to be done and what the situations are uh, in greater Minnesota. Right, yeah. And in fact, the focus of your project was really talking to local government officials and their relationship with the immigrant and refugee populations. But you were basing uh, the, some of the framework of your project on a survey that had been done by the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs and a survey that they had done of Latino residents in rural towns. Is that correct? And, and how, did those, how did that fit in with your research? One thing that I thought was interesting about that report that the Minnesota Council for Latino Affairs did was that the title of it was Latino Minnesotans in the time of COVID-19. And it didn't mention rurality or greater Minnesota in the title, but they, they, they did focus it there and they chose, they chose to do that um, very purposefully. So I thought it was, uh, it really centered greater Minnesota in, in a way that that, that it didn't have to based on like the title and the scope of the project. Um, so so I, I appreciated that. Um, I think it fit into our project by letting us know um, what communities identified as issues or things they needed work done, priorities for their community um, in a way that we just couldn't have gotten without that report. You know, there's, there's no other report that tells this is what Latino community members in greater Minnesota think, right? There's not like 10 sources we can get on that. There's just the one that they did. So it's extremely valuable to see, you know, oh, people are wanting driver's licenses for all because the reality is that there's undocumented people who can't get driver's licenses, um, but they're part of our workforce and uh, they're gonna be on our roads. So we should probably, make that a little formal and safer by getting them able to have driver's training. And, uh, you know, so things like that, 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 that project revealed that I would never have thought of, that we would just never have had the knowledge of without their work. Yeah, absolutely. And considering the fact that, you know, our, most of our findings and analysis comes from about 20 interviews with local government officials and uh, community leaders in four cities, Having the MCLA report really augmented our study because as much as local government officials and community leaders had a lot of amazing things to say, 
ultimately, most of these folks are not from the immigrant and refugee communities that you know, we're discussing in terms of this government outreach. And so the, the MCLA report really allowed us to only speak with local government officials while not sacrificing the perspectives of immigrants and refugees in the four communities that we chose. And so speaking of the communities, I figure I should give a little bit of an intro into the target areas, the, the areas of where we, we, we spoke with people. So we studied Wilmer, Worthington, Austin, and Pelican Rapids. Now, these are all cities that are predominantly in southern Minnesota, although Pelican Rapids is more west central. Um, but all of these communities have seen immense uh, increases in diversity in the last 20 years. And they're all meatpacking towns. And so they all have a major meatpacking employer that uh, not only is important for the local economy, but also employs most of the immigrants and refugees that are um, arriving into the town. And so how did you, was that basically what you, the parameters that you used to choose those four cities or did you, uh, was there any other, any other considerations put into that? Those were the parameters. Um, you know, there, there are other cities that could have fit those parameters. Uh, I think there were certain ones that we knew were important to focus on just because of recent events as well. Um, you know, you have, you, you have big COVID outbreaks at, at JBS and Worthington that, that became a big story that kind of put Worthington on the map. So some of it's timing. Um, not that they were the only place with COVID outbreaks. Um, I think in Austin, you just had uh, Councilman Obala Obala uh, elected to the city council there, you know, the first refugee serving on city council. So it would have been kind of a crime for, for our project not to look at Austin when we're focused on immigrants and refugees in greater Minnesota. Um, and then I, one thing that I liked about Pelican Rapids was it gave us it gave us a much smaller community because uh, Worthington, Wilmer, and Austin are, are in a different population bracket. And so um, I, I think that gave us some diversity in, in the level of rurality in the community. I'm not as versed in the, uh, the lingo as, as Whitney probably is, so I don't know if that's the appropriate. Yeah, that was, that was good. Um, yeah, and Pelican Rapids, if I remember correctly, has a big mix of different ethnic and racial groups. Is that is it much more diverse compared to the other three cities, or do the other three cities have more different groups that we just don't hear about? You know, all four of our communities have many different ethnicities and cultures represented uh, because one of the things that's not when you're thinking about immigrants and refugees, it's not just the, the racial identity or the original national identity of, of the folks moving in, it's also um, the culture, the spoken language. There's hundreds of first languages spoken around the state and in rural areas. And so Pelican Rapids, you know, they have a, a very strong community identity with these different uh, immigrant and refugee groups. I think in part just because the town was so small before this influx that it just really kind of changed the whole environment really quickly in Pelican Rapids. Whereas that change has been a little bit slower in places like Austin, which you know has always been a, a little bit larger, but now is, is growing even more rapidly. Now, so let's get on to the project. Your, your project used what's called qualitative research methods. And I just wanted to call this out a little at first for listeners who don't, you know, who aren't super familiar with how we do our research. When we think of research, especially in the social sciences, we usually think of it as, you know, number crunching and spreadsheets and doing a lot of statistical analysis and things like that. Um, the number crunching is what we call 
quantitative research or quantitative research methods, but your project really relied on qualitative research. So what's the difference? So uh, qualitative research, that's more my bread and butter for sure. I've never been there. I've never excelled at, at mathematics. Um, so, you know, I, I love talking with people, hearing people's perspectives. And I think one of the benefits of qualitative research, this research that's based in, you know, reading and speaking with other people and, and kind of intuiting different themes is that you can often see a lot more nuance in what someone is saying than in a number or specific data set. Because with data and with quantitative work, it's, it has to be specific in order to you know, garner the numbers that you need. But in that specificity, sometimes you can lose the nuance that I think is really important for a study like this that looks so much at uh, community cohesion and community togetherness and, and integration and bias and these issues that aren't really easy to quantify or to study in that way. Yeah, these attitudes is, a, I think, a lot of what your research in this project involved, and you can't really measure attitudes with numbers. So you did, uh, so a lot of qualitative research is just interviewing people. Well, without being too detailed, because they have to remain anonymous, we, we, uh, we interviewed, we started by interviewing uh, public officials, uh, including employees, or electeds, um, you know, including school district employees, that sort of thing. And over the course of our study, uh, we expanded that a bit to maybe uh, other community leaders, people who serve on commissions, um, people who work at nonprofits who are active in the community. And part of the reason we expanded the scope was because it was easier to access people in some communities than others. Uh, we, got, we got a strong response from Austin uh, and, and a lot of our interviews were focused there. Um, but, but other communities, it was, it was harder to gain access to. And that's a big thing with qualitative research. Uh, you know, people have to put up a big time commitment. They have to give you an hour instead of five minutes for a survey. And so, yeah, those partnering with commission members and nonprofit members really helped uh, get some perspectives on cities that were different but also um, give us insight into cities where maybe the communication just wasn't there for elected officials. And I should mention too, uh, we probably should have mentioned this at the beginning. It wasn't just you two that were doing this research. There's actually uh, four students in your group, wasn't there? Yes, and I apologize. We're just not giving our other teammates credit here. Yeah, so on top of uh, me and Josiah, we had Izzy Galen and Ryan Redmer join us um, in the study. Amazing teammates. Their contributions cannot be understated. So if you're listening to this, we appreciate you. We haven't forgotten. Excellent. Yeah, we didn't want to leave them out. <laughs> you certainly couldn't. Uh, you'd, you'd need qualitative research to, to really describe their contributions. Quantitative research wouldn't do it justice. <laughs> so you two and Izzy and Ryan went out and interviewed all these uh, officials. What were the kinds of questions you were asking them or what were you looking for with these questions? Yeah, so our, our interviews took an hour and we asked an, an array of questions, but our three research questions, which kind of cut to the core of uh, what we spoke about in our interviews are first, what do local government officials and community leaders identify as the most pressing, pressing issues facing their local and immigrant refugee populations? We also looked at what strengths and challenges local government officials and community partners cite in their primary outreach and inclusion efforts, as well as uh, a comparison with this data from the previous research on the Minnesota Council for Latino Affairs, so that we can get a sense of what is similar or different in these conversations. So often I know in my interviews, we would start off, I would just ask about you know, the history of uh, the demographic change in that area. All of these towns at one point in not that long ago were 
predominantly, if not all white or Caucasian. And so it's often in the front of a lot of community leaders' minds, you know, when the shift started happening and why that often has to do with workforce needs. Like in Austin, there was the, um, there was the strike, the Hormel strike. And after that is when a lot of immigrants started being recruited to work in the Hormel plant in Austin. And so all of these were really important for the context building in, in understanding, okay, what is the community makeup? What are the, what are the community ideas and perceptions that, that are already existing? And usually from there, you know, the conversation would flow pretty easily. I think in part because, you know, these government leaders all recognized that immigrants and refugees are vital for their town's economy, for their town's workforce, uh, for the future of the community really. And most of them were really open to talking about this because they understand that, you know, this, this change has been challenging to navigate in some sense for the communities, but it's also been what has saved a lot of these towns from, you know, the population decline that we see in, in other smaller rural areas. Do you wanna add anything, Josiah? Sure, yeah, I, I would just say, you know, I always led with, with the same question in these interviews. Uh, and, and I just ask, um, and I think we all started with this. I would ask, uh, how frequently do you work and interact with the community's immigrant and refugee populations? Um, and from here, our interviewees were so ready to speak do everything they do in their communities. And just from this one question, I'd get, I'd get 10 minutes of content of, of people sharing uh, everything they do to all, what their values are. Uh, and, and across the board, almost entirely, you know, people were so excited about what their, what their cities were doing to serve their immigrant and refugee communities. Uh, and, and it just came out in that question. Uh, and we'd follow up to get more nuance and ask about specific services, like, you know, to, to follow up with questions about housing and, and what housing issues exist or, uh, or economic development. And, and those would sort of be tailored to the interviewee. You know, if the interviewee, if I, if I knew they worked in economic development, I'd make sure I followed up there because you, you, you have to guide the interview to, uh, to match the, what the person's going to know. And so once you got all of these interviews done, you gathered up all your information, looked for common themes, and what were your findings out of all of this? Our findings were pretty vast. Actually, at first it was kind of hard to conceptualize um, a, like a narrative for, for this project because when it comes to population change and really the face and fabric of a community changing entirely, I mean, it touches every, every aspect of, of governance and of community cohesion. But what we were able to find is that of the issues and challenges cited in our interviews, we really found five key points or umbrella points essentially that a lot of our content fit under. And so those were the issues and challenges that we heard cited were social cohesion and cultural bias, government outreach attitudes and barriers, language and communication barriers, representation in government and public institutions, and finally the rural housing deficit. And so these five groupings were really useful for us to kind of understand, okay, what are like the major issues that we're hearing cited in our interviews and then after that, we go on to compare those findings with the MCLA report. And so out of these findings, out of these five findings, which would you say were the most surprising and maybe the most useful for policy going forward? I guess I would discuss uh, the attitudes toward outreach. Um, uh, so government outreach was a big topic that, that we discussed with people. Uh, and we saw sort of, we saw a couple different attitudes or a couple different structures in cities. Um, we saw cities that really valued government outreach to communities, uh, specifically to immigrant and refugee communities. Um, 
and in these communities, there was sort of an understanding uh, that I think our, uh, you know, if, if, if we're honest, our group, our group shares this viewpoint um, that outreach to immigrant and refugee communities is, is necessary um, because without outreach to try and involve them, uh, they're just so much more likely to not engage in civic institutions. Um, so this would be like going to them, making them aware of resources or inviting them to be uh, taking part in various events and, and boards and councils and things like that. Exactly, exactly. That's the type of government outreach we're talking about. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> Um, and so some cities, most cities, most officials we spoke to really valued that. Um, we had people saying, we have to do more of absolute necessity. Um, then we also had people saying, we value it, but I don't think our community has done it, has implemented it. And I'm not sure we've prioritized it and started to wonder what can we do about that? How can we do this outreach and make this value a reality? There was a third type of perspective that we saw where they didn't value uh, government outreach to these communities and they saw it as more of the role of any citizen. If they wanna be involved, they need to come to the local government, they need to speak up. And uh, we actually made a recommendation based on, on outreach. Um, because every city that we looked at has a commission that they've formed. Um, so city council has, has voted to form a commission. Um, in Austin and Wilmer, there's a human rights commission in each city. Um, in Worthington, there's a new cross-cultural uh, commission. And in Pelican Rapids, they've had like this multicultural commission for a while. And so every, every city has a commission that sort of works in this general area that involves immigrant and refugees, um, inclusion, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so one of, our, one of our recommendations was that these commissions could form a bit of a network um, and speak to each other about why, you know, what, why they value outreach, uh, why outreach to immigrant and refugee communities strengthens community, share with each other what they've done uh, in their communities to do outreach. One of the great examples I think we have of a community doing good outreach was in Austin. They, they formed the honorary council member position and they really do a lot of outreach to, to specifically to young people of color in the town um, to, to get on these to get on in this honorary council position. And they, they tell us that, you know, when people do this, those people go on to be on boards and commissions in the city. Um, and so it really, it really builds capacity in these communities that, uh, for, for leadership. And so they could share best practices like that um, if, they, if they became uh, connected. Yeah, because one of the issues that we've heard for years is about this, um kind of the, the problem of building capacity, leadership capacity in immigrant and refugee groups, not for leadership within their own communities, but getting them involved in the civic process of the larger community. And, and that's what this was getting at pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and to go off of that, like another issue we saw that has to do with representation and increasing representation and access in public institutions is hiring practices and employment barriers. So one, actually multiple interviewees, I believe talked at length about how they want diverse candidates. They want diverse employees. They want employees that are representative of the community, you know, at the city level, at the, at the county level. And is that, and, um, this, these are employees in local government, right? At the, like the city, city government, county government? Yeah, yeah, like local government or like public institutions. So you can even think about like police and, and like the sheriff's office. You know, there was some conversations in our interviews about uh, diversifying the police force. 
But you know, the barrier that we kept hearing in our interviews was hiring qualifications because a lot of these folks don't, immigrants or refugees don't necessarily have the uh, educational requirements that we have assigned for these roles. But that doesn't mean they're not capable of performing these roles, particularly with you know, a little bit of training. I think one of the barriers that we were kind of fleshing out in this project is how and when should public institutions modify their requirements without you know, sacrificing? Mm. Well, I think I know what you're getting at. It's like, it's gonna take kind of a universal mindset shift of what we as white American Minnesotans believe is necessary for a person, the the skills or education for a person to have in a particular role as an employee in a particular um, position. And what that person actually does need. You know, do you need a four year degree to do this particular thing? Or you ju- do you just need training to do this particular thing? Is that kind of what you're thinking about? Yeah, precisely. Um, that's precisely right. So it's really not so much of, um, oh, immigrants just don't have the training, just don't have the education that they need for this, you know, to r- work at the, you know, the, the county licensing office. Um, it's that, We need to actually examine what the skills are and not necessarily, or what the, what skills are necessary and not necessarily what education is necessary. And does that fit into our current concept of what that position needs? Does that sound right? Yeah, it definitely does. We had someone with a quote who really nailed it on the head where they said, you know, it's a it's about matching our police force to our community needs, not matching our police force to, you know, a set of prescribed qualifications. And but I, I think that, you know, this wasn't so much a topic in our research report, but I think some of the difficulty in in having that mindset shift that you mentioned is we're we're sort of moving past this this old era of thinking about things like affirmative action or quotas, right? Things that really were controversial and, and rubbed a lot of people the wrong way um, into, a, into, into that new mindset of, well, let's make a focus on hiring these people, not as an end unto itself, but because we need them and because we need this specific skill set that they can offer uh, and shifting to that narrative is a lot more productive and a lot more helpful and I think a lot less alienating for for any one group. Treating them as valuable members of the community. Right. Yeah. Rather, rather, rather than like tokens. Yes. Yeah. So so playing off the word token, you did mention that in uh, when you were looking at representation in government and public institutions that there was, there is, or was kind of an era of the, the token immigrant or refugee. Tell us more about that. Well, so, you know, as we discussed, there's these barriers in um, immigrant and refugee access to government and public institutions. But, you know, some people did and have and continue to step up usually of their own volition. And those folks, because they're out there saying, you know, I wanna make change or I have these thoughts, they are viewed essentially as kind of a a token for their community. And while I don't think this is malicious or intentional on on the part of, you know, like the, the white leaders in the community, I think it's just a nature of like, oh, we don't have very many immigrant and refugee voices. So here's this immigrant and or refugee who's stepping up. Let's now ask them anytime we have a question because we know them, right? It's like about who you know. And 
we heard frequently that despite the rapid diversification of, of these cities, there's still so much self-segregation, even between identity groups, like within the immigrant and refugee populations. And so that just kind of leads the tokenization of, of people who do step up because they're asked then so many times to, to be a representative or to be on this board because they're maybe the only person from that community that the rest of like the leaders know. That's kind of the danger in any organization that, you know, the, that one person who volunteers and all of a sudden they're the one who ends up being volunteered for everything. And uh, it, I suppose there's, there's burnout. So is there any work being done to try and get more people involved in, um, you know, get more immigrants and refugees involved in civic organizations? And also where does language and communication barriers, uh, where do they factor into all this? I think a great example goes back to the outreach example I gave earlier, uh, where in Austin, they started the honorary council member position. And one thing they did that sort of circumvented language barriers in a sense, was they made sure to target their council position to young people. Uh, and young people, are much more likely in these communities to be like more of the second generation uh, and really be native English speakers uh, to where that, that communication barrier just isn't there. So if you're smart about, about um, being inclusive of young people, not just, not just thinking in ethnic or racial terms, then you can, then you can build leadership uh, in your community without even running into that language barrier. Um, and I think it's also smart because young people have a lot of capacity for doing these things. They don't have, you know, four kids and have to work full time uh, necessarily. They're not juggling as much. And so, so you're not gonna run into some of those other barriers as much. That's another idea of, you know, of mindset shift is, you know, targeting younger people for this. Another area of mindset shift that we maybe need is in the area of housing. We have a massive housing shortage in greater Minnesota as it is for anybody. We all know the real estate market is going crazy wherever you are in this country. But um, this really plays into this issue in particular for immigrants and refugees, just because they have a different set of needs for housing, right? That your average white family doesn't? Yeah, absolutely. What we heard in our interviews time and time again was this need for large housing that can accommodate a multi-generational family. That's a much more common cultural practice. And it also, you know, makes sense to have a, a larger family living together. You know, you can lean on each other for the care of children or, or housework or that sort of thing. There's a lot of logical reasons behind it, but the reality is we don't have that housing stock in, in these rural areas. You know, as you said, Marnie, like housing is an issue everywhere in the state of Minnesota, rural, urban, whatever. Uh, but in, in rural Minnesota, we had this lack of not only affordable housing, but also market rate housing, because it's really hard for these municipalities to attract developers because there's not that much of a profit incentive for developers to you know, be building homes, especially homes large enough to accommodate a multi-generational family in, in cities like Austin or Worthington. And you know, that's an area too, where I think perhaps um, the state or the state legislature could step up to incentivize you know, development in rural areas because these communities have a, tough time advocating for themselves on that front because, you know, like the tax base isn't huge. Like the, these, these cities, these counties don't have a ton of money to spend attracting developers, just like they don't have a ton of money to spend for translating all of their documents to make sure that there's like language access, you know, resources. It's a major, major theme in our project and specifically the lack of resources. And one thing I should 
jump in here and mention too that we've been mentioning a lot more lately at the center is that rural areas and rural communities don't have that network of nonprofits and advocacy groups that you have in urban centers like in the Twin Cities. It simply doesn't exist. When it comes to using resources on things like those services, whereas you may have some nonprofits be able to step up and take care of that in urban areas, that really does fall on the local government. And if they don't have the resources for it, it, it just doesn't get done, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Josiah, you know, I know in speaking about housing, you had a particular interest in uh, manufactured housing and this conversation that's uh, happening right now in rural Minnesota as, as a potential way to curb this housing deficit. Yeah, thanks, Whitney. Um, we, we saw some interesting things come up around mobile home parks and manufactured housing in our interviews. Um, at least uh, two city councils were portrayed in our interviews as having pretty negative feelings about mobile home parks uh, and manufactured homes. Um, whether that was uh, just, just comments about, you know, man, that community is blighted. I wish we could, you know, tear it down and do something else there but recognizing that they couldn't because they need to preserve affordable housing. Um, or or we, we heard some stories of just city council opposition to uh, investments in preserving uh, local mobile home parks. Um, and one, one, one interviewee mentioned to us that localities playbook with regards to mobile home parks is essentially, you know, if it goes up for sale, we're gonna acquire it, we're gonna demolish it, and we're gonna redevelop um, the land. And so we have this narrative of just not, value, not valuing the most affordable form of housing we have in the entire state. And at the same time, we're seeing these very same interviewees describe the rural housing deficit and all the challenges. So we just have, we saw a bit of a disconnect there, but there were also some encouraging signs. Um, we were told that JBS uh, in Worthington was interested in investing their own resources in, in a new uh, mobile home park development. Um, we heard the same from uh, at least two nonprofit partners that work in Southwest Minnesota. Uh, and so there, there is also some energy more on the employer uh, nonprofit side than the city council side that is maybe starting to think about manufactured homes, mobile home parks in, in better terms and, and valuing them as assets of affordable housing, um, which, which we think is important uh, given, the, given the crunch we're seeing. That's something that we haven't really heard come up yet in our research is where manufactured housing and mobile home parks fit in all of this. But what you said about JBS was really interesting because a lot of the problem with the housing shortage is that it is simply more lucrative for builders to build in urban areas where they can get a lot more for their house. And that's simply because the price of materials and labor has gone up so extraordinarily in the last couple of years. And so it doesn't make financial sense for them to build houses in small communities where they don't have a lot of potential customers who can cover that amount. So if you have a company like JBS coming in and throwing some money into it to kind of sweeten the pot for them, but keep the price of the house at a manageable level, does that sound like a helpful situation? That's a really helpful situation. Um, the investments of these meatpacking employers in these communities are, are crucial to getting anything done. And that probably goes double for housing where it's so hard to get anything done right now. Um, and, and JBS, you know, they, they likely recognize that this would be housing for their workforce you know, in the one mobile home park in Worthington right now, 60% of the residents work at JBS. Uh, and so, and so this, this idea that these meatpacking employers, they're, they're making investments that they're going to benefit from. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think that's great. 
that can help us get, get the right things done for these communities. Any other findings that jumped out at you that we need to talk about? Yeah, you know, I think there was one other that we haven't discussed yet that I, I just wanted to bring up. And this was the, the, the bias and racism that we heard about, especially when it comes to the first versus second wave of immigrants. So as we talked about earlier, you know, these towns have all been rapidly diversifying for 20 years, but it hasn't always been the same groups or the same cultures like coming in. And so we really have heard in our interviews that uh, the Hispanic community, which predominantly was like a first wave immigrant community in these towns has like quote unquote assimilated better to the town or is you know more a part of the town now. We heard that in interviews. You know, one of our thoughts as researchers was, is this just because they've been here longer? You know, small towns, right? Like when your kids go to school with each other, when you've been in an area long enough, like, of course you fit in more, you know, like it seems logical, but, you know, with the way Hispanic folks were talked about, Latino folks were talked about versus um, uh, Muslims, uh, Somali people, uh, Karen, as well. I'm trying to think of other demographics and maybe Josiah, you could help me out with that. But these second wave immigrants are kind of looked as like, oh, they're not doing as much. They're not trying as hard to be a part of the community like the, like the Latinos were. And so this was kind of this disconnect we heard in our interviews in regarding public perceptions towards first and second wave uh, communities. Do you think maybe that what people are saying about the second and I should say like, you know, the white residents, longtime white residents are yes, saying, thank you. yeah, are, are saying about the second wave of immigrants. Do you think that's maybe what they were saying about the first wave of immigrants when they first started coming in and that in 20 years, they might be saying the same thing now that they're saying about Latino immigrants? That, Absolutely. You know, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It seems... It's, it's kind of one of the more obvious findings, you know, but I think it's important to mention, right? I think it's, I think historical memory and uh, the way we create our own histories, even in just like the way we, we talk about our, our towns, our, our communities, whatever, like that's really important. And mm -hmm. uh, we have, with this mindset shift, right, that you mentioned earlier, Marnie, like we have another opportunity here to have a mindset shift to, you know, kind of over overcome what seems to be this cyclical pattern of being like, oh, well, they just don't get it. They're not trying as hard, you know, like this is a mindset shift that we can easily overcome and then get more work done after. And I wonder if our historical memories aren't uh, somewhat selective to on you know, what we choose to remember about various things. Absolutely. I, I believe our historical memory is highly selective, but sorry, yeah. <laughs> it sounds so judgy. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, it's true. We choose to, you know, remember what we like, you know, or, you know, or what upset us, you know, and things like that. And it's human nature. It is. That doesn't mean we can't recognize that and and take steps to to not have those perceptions anymore right yeah um so looking ahead what's uh what do you you know when you do research it always leads to more research questions so what were some of the the things that uh that you came up with that you really thought needed to be like the next step one thing we were really interested in further research on is partnerships, uh, because like we said, these partnerships with local employers, um, nonprofits really drive a lot of the investment uh, that's happening in the community at large and in immigrant and refugee communities specifically. Um, and so it would be great to do some research that really assesses, you know, what is, what is, what do the networks of partnerships look like in these communities? And that can assess, you know, 
is Austin really working at max capacity with the partners that they could have? Is there, are there two or three massive employers or large employers in Austin that are just not networked, uh, that are not partnered with to do things that are mutually beneficial? I wanna stress the mutually beneficial. A lot of these partnerships are, it's not philanthropy, right? When they partner, they deliver things in the community that benefit the employer and the community. Uh, and I think if we, if we could understand that better, uh, you know, if we could understand, you know, if, if Pelican Rapids maybe isn't as partnered with West Central Turkeys as, as, as Austin is with Hormel, obviously of different scales at play does here. It, doesn't Hormel own West Central Turkeys though? <laughs> <laughs> they they do and hormel owns genio genio and west central turkeys i think is the structure but but that that doesn't translate to how the partnerships work in the local communities right um you know if, if someone in pelican rapids is trying to partner with west central turkeys they're trying to partner with west central turkeys right right um, yeah because it is all local yeah um, and so, so understanding better if there's room to increase partnerships and increase that network, uh, those networks and communities, um, it would be a great next step. And if they're already maxed out and, uh, and, and they're still needing a lot, a lot of investment that's not happening, well, then you have a great case to say, we need state resources because we're doing everything we can. Um, so it also builds a case for state investment for, further down the line if we do that research. Okay, and, and what else? Whitney, did you have anything else? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely some questions that I think I still have after completing this, this project, particularly about, you know, the more specific methods for partnerships. How, what are the different ways that public-private partnerships can operate. You know, I would love to see research in the future going in and looking at maybe these same communities, maybe different ones, and doing more in-depth in depth look on the partnership aspect. And because this project really focused on government outreach and all the all of the ways that government outreach can manifest uh, for immigrants and refugees in rural Minnesota. But you know, if we're looking from more of like a community development uh, side or a lens for research project, you know, I think that's when we can start looking at these partnerships and these relationships within cities or counties or between, uh, you know, a rural area and, and the state politics and start thinking about ways we can maximize everyone's um, investment and input. Right. I think we've kind of come to the end. What do you guys think? Is there anything else that needs to be mentioned? Because I thought of one more thing, but I wanted to check and see if you guys had anything else. Well, Josiah, I know you uh, know more about the MCLA report than I do because you did so much work on that uh, in our project. Is there any similarities or differences between our interviews and findings and the Minnesota Council for Latino Affairs report that you think are worth mentioning on this podcast? I guess to me, some of the biggest things in the MCLA report that communities were concerned about uh, that didn't come up in our interviews were some of the things they're hoping can happen at the state level, uh, like driver's licenses for all, um, and using individual taxpayer identification numbers uh, for uh, accessing certain benefits. You know, we didn't hear those from local officials. There wasn't like, I guess there, maybe there wasn't like an awareness from local officials of like, this is what this communicate, community is advocating for at the state level. They, they didn't know the community that well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose, yeah, Go I suppose ahead. because it's not something that they at a local level have any control over. Right. And I, I don't say that to yeah, pa pass judgment on them for not knowing that. I, it's just, uh, it's something that stood out to me, mm -hmm. I guess, when I conceive of building power, I think. I think, you know, they, they would have, that, that if they're advocating for that, they'd get the local people involved 
evolved. I don't know. I guess I guess I think of it as a almost a strategy for for the for the advocacy for those things. Uh, you know, to get the the people in power in your in your local area involved as you're advocating for those things as a community member um, would probably be so helpful to getting the ear of your your legislator, um, especially with how small these communities are. Rural communities really have to stand up for themselves uh, in in the state legislature. And I think you you bring up a really great point, Josiah, about how if we can build these this power at the local level, that will make it easier to go go to the state and say, hey, look, here's everything that we're doing. Here's still the barriers that we face or, or the challenges and issues that we face. I think it would create a very uh, excellent argument, you know, if the community kind of comes together as a whole saying, like, come on. Yeah, and to connect, to connect back to what I said, as I kind of introduced my interest in rural areas, I think the more, the more we see community groups uh, organizing and advocating at the local level and working up the chain to the state level, the less that state level politics is, is gonna be about, hey, let's craft some urban versus rural narratives to profit, profit off of and more, more to be about let's serve these communities who are working with us. So speaking of partnerships, this kind of circles back to the beginning. Besides the uh, Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs, you talked with other of the state diversity councils too, right? What, who, who were all the, the partners in this project? You had the councils and some faculty and who all was involved? Yeah, so big thank you to Kelly Ash at the Center for Rural Policy. He helped us out a ton, as well as uh, Professor Greg Lindsay at the Humphrey School. He advised this project as we completed it this semester. And um, the uh, partner organizations that we had were the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs, the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage, and Council for Asian Pacific Minnesotans. And it's really helpful. We had representatives from um, all three of those councils, which are you know state-based state, state based created at the state level, speaking with us about what they know about uh, immigrant and refugee issues, particularly in rural areas. You know, one thing that was interesting though about uh, these partnerships was that, you know, the these councils don't have a huge capacity. I mean, it's a pretty small team that's like formed and funded by the state. And so this was kind of an opportunity for everyone to get a better look at the landscape of uh, outreach in rural Minnesota, because there's just not the capacity at the councils for the most part to do extensive outreach in rural areas due to you know multiple barriers and factors. That's why we use the MCLA report so much because there was that you know overt effort to include rural voices and rural immigrants and refugees, and that's amazing. But you know we can't expect that type of work from every single council, given the, given their limited capacity and their limited funding and and purview. I would just like to close by saying that one of the biggest things I learned in this process was that rural people care. People in Greater Minnesota care. Um, they care about their immigrant and refugee communities, they value them, um, and they are looking for ways to do new things, to create new programs, to invest in these communities. Um, and I just think that's such an important narrative to build. And that is, that is what a lot of our interviewees closed on when we asked them the same question. And they said, we want people to understand what rural Minnesota really is and the way, what our communities are really made up of and the way we really value the immigrants and refugees we have here. Great, that's a perfect closing. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Whitney and Josiah, this was a great episode. Yeah, thank you so much, it was a pleasure to be on. You've been listening to the Center of Everywhere podcast, where we explore stories of rural Minnesotans who are making a difference in their communities. Rural isn't in the middle of nowhere. It is in the center of everywhere.